I think you'll really enjoy this lecture. It's, it's probably one of the most favorite lectures that I do present and I have uh, that I think will help a lot of you as well as your clients and have a better understanding of why you really do need it. So if we look at in regards to the historical perspective of fats, fats have been blamed for many, many different issues. So we can think of all the chronic diseases that we have these days. So you always think of fat and you think of heart disease, uh, myocardial infarction, anything to do with the heart. You think of diabetes, and then you think of just the epidemic of obesity that we have uh, in not just America and Australia, but all over the world. Uh, I travel internationally, and it's surprising to see that it's not just Americans that are fat with all our McDonald's and everything else. And fat may be a part of the problem, uh, but in my opinion, there's, there's other factors for that. For any disease that we have in this day and age, it's always multifactorial. It's never just going to be one thing that's the, the ultimate cause of it. So it's been blamed for a lot of the chronic diseases. Now, it started out being that cholesterol. Don't eat cholesterol. Avoid cholesterol like the plague. Uh, it's bad for your heart. It's going to clog your arteries. Um, all these different uh, sorts of information were coming out from the medical community, from the Dietetic Association, from the Diabetes Association. And really, if you look back at the history, we haven't been able to make up our mind. So, for example, if you look at the, the whole egg issue, years ago it was don't eat eggs. Eggs have cholesterol and saturated fat. It's bad for you. It's bad for your heart. Uh, don't eat them. Nowadays it's, well, no. Well, eggs are okay. I mean, if you really think about it, it's, it's very similar to fashion, right? It's an, this kind of cycle of things that come back into vogue and everything else, and it, it's somewhat similar with the nutrition. Um, unfortunately, uh, some of the institutes and so forth can't make up their mind. But if you look at just normal uh, and physiological function and the chemical structure of fats, uh, you'll realize that eggs are completely fine uh, to consume. And I'll go into that in more detail as we get onto the lecture. And then you went into don't eat saturated fats. So they said, don't eat saturated fats. They're really bad for you. Artery clogging uh, causes diabetes and so forth. Uh, and then what they told us to do is they told us to eat vegetable oils. So an interesting part of that history was during this period of time when they said that fats are bad for you, the, the saturated fats. The edible oil industry said, hey, butter, lard, beef tallow, those are a bit more expensive. Let's extract all these vegetable oils from corn, from soybeans, from cottonseed, and let's sell these and market them as a healthy oil. And they sound healthier uh, over a period of time versus eating a big fat steak. You think that's a bit unhealthy, and they think that vegetable oils are healthier. But in fact, later on, they realized, actually, they told us to eat low fat as well at the period of time as well, but what happens is they say, well, don't eat fat, eat low fat, and eat the vegetable oils, and what ends up happening? Years later, it's trans fats. So now you have labeling on every single food of, is there the total fat, the saturated fats, and are there any trans fats? And we know that through research, and all of you know that trans fats uh, can be very harmful to the system. And we'll go into actually how it will harm the body and the, the structure of the body. So what I'm going to do within uh, this next hour and a half is really go into all the different myths about fats and what we think we know about fats and really to extract the truth uh, about fats, whether it's saturated fats, the monounsaturated fats, the PUFAs, the essential fatty acids, so that you have a better understanding so that you can help guide your clients uh, as well as yourself as to what really is a, a good fat and a healthy fat. So if you look at this uh, slide, it's just simply a picture of a cell structure. So I just want you to focus on these guys right here, so the little uh, round balls, and then you see these little tails. And you see at the bottom here, that's another round ball, and then there's little tails here. So those are what we call phospholipids. And so with every single cell of your body, doesn't matter if it's in your eyeball, in your liver, um, every single cell of your body has these phospholipids. Think of these guys as the way that the cell communicates with another cell. 
So if you don't have enough fats in your system or you have the wrong fats, uh, you're not going to have good cell communication down to the cellular level. And this is how important it is. So for someone to recommend a low-fat diet, which technically, if you want percentages, it's about 10% and underneath that. And if you think about 10%, have you guys ever calculated what 10% in a caloric diet of maybe 2,000 calories is? Have you guys ever figured that out? I mean, it's almost nearly impossible to do that just in general because if you look at even a banana or some vegetables, they have minor amounts of fruit in it. I mean, you literally have to try to cut out the fat in a chicken breast, which is, I mean, the leanest as you can probably go or a turkey breast. So it's very, very difficult to do. Uh, and you need fat in order for your cells to function. It just comes down to that in terms of biochemistry. And then you guys remember this mitochondria cell in chemistry, biology? It's the powerhouse cell, quote unquote. And this is the way your body produces energy. What we fail to realize is that you're, we're always focused on you need to eat your, your carbs, your, your vegetables, and everything else, and those are good sources. But your body can manufacture energy through fats. Uh, what it is is called beta oxidation. So you guys remember the Krebs cycle and ATP and that whole production. Well, beta oxidation is another offshoot of how your body utilizes fatty acids. It breaks it down to acetyl-CoA, and that becomes a precursor to energy production. And your body can use fats as an energy source. And there's research showing that. It's just that there's, such a, there's been such a big push and there continues to be a big push that you need carbohydrates all the time. Uh, there are a number of other ways that your body can create energy besides just using carbohydrates and, and getting glucose into the brain and to the, to the eyes and to the vital organs of your body. So just remember that, that your body can use fats as an energy source. Uh, it's a very good energy source and a long-lasting one. Fats are very important for your ADEC your absorption of all your fat-soluble vitamins. For example, with vitamin A, we know vitamin A is very important for the retina, for the eyes. So anybody that has eye issues, definitely vitamin A is massively important for that. Uh, we also know that it's important for the immune system. So a lot of people that have an issue with chronically getting colds all the time, um, they're sick all the time, they always get sinus infections, they're on antibiotics two or three times through the winter months. Uh, classically, vitamin A is probably deficient in that person. There's a difference between beta carotene and vitamin A. When your body gets vi uh, beta carotene, it has to convert to vitamin A in order body for your body to use it. Whenever you get it from fats, it's readily usable to the body. So it's very, very important for vitamin A. Vitamin D, you guys probably have heard about this even more. Uh, if you type in vitamin D into public medical records or any sort of search engine site about research, there's probably, at this point, probably over 20,000 studies on vitamin D, whereas uh, three years ago, there was maybe about 7,000 or so, when I checked a couple years ago. So there's more and more research coming up about vitamin D as well. And we know about vitamin E. Vitamin E is important as an antioxidant, and so you need to get that antioxidant to protect your system overall in the long run, especially if you exercise. Because the more that you breathe, you're breathing in oxygen, but you're also producing carbon dioxide. And we don't realize that the carbon dioxide can be a potent uh, free radical within the system. So it's important to have the antioxidants, and you get them to some of the fats. And vitamin K, I would say, some people say uh, is on par with the vitamin D, because vitamin K is very much related with how thin your blood is. And so we know that the thicker your blood gets, the more that your blood pressure is going to go up. So if you think about trying to push water through a tube versus trying to push ketchup through a tube, you know how much pressure you have to give. And that's what's happening. Uh, even in some states in, in America, they're saying in the state of Mississippi, 80% of people are pre-diabetic and have uh, blood that's almost the viscosity of ketchup. You can imagine that. Just with their lifestyle. Uh, I mean, you go down to some of these, um, these states in the south and everything is fried. Vegetables are fried. Chicken is fried. I mean, everything is fried. Um, so uh, your, your fats can affect your body in that way. But vitamin K is very important in regards to that sort of uh, the thinness of the blood that we do need to allow it to flow freely without stressing the system out. And also the minerals are a big one. So we look at, 
for example, magnesium. Magnesium is involved in over 300 processes in the body, actually 350 uh, if you get down to the nitty-gritty. And I talked about it yesterday a few times. Uh, magnesium is very, very important. I think more important than calcium. There's been a, such a big push on calcium, calcium, calcium for bone. But magnesium always gets depleted with stress. And how many of you in this room have zero stress? Raise your hand. Raise high. Super high. Zero stress. Well, you're lucky, man. All right. <laughs> so most of us have some type of stress within the system. And every time you get stressed mentally, emotionally, physically, your magnesium levels tend to drop off. And if you go on a low-fat diet, it makes it even worse because your body cannot utilize the magnesium. This is just a picture of all the different hormones in your body. So if you look at it, we have estradiol, you have testosterone, DHEA, cortisol. I do these types of tests with clients uh, and athletes that I work with because it gives me a snapshot of where their hormonal status is at because we all know that hormones are very powerful substances in the body that control lots of different mechanisms. And so I'll often have them test their saliva, and then I'll look at the hormones. As you'll see later, with cholesterol and your fats, they're very, very important for the production of your hormones. So typically, the response of people that have a low-fat diet for a long period of time, they tend to have disruptions in their hormonal cycle, especially for a lot of my female athletes and clients that tend to either want to, they're training really hard or maybe their body fat level gets too low over a period of time, then what do we know happens? What happens to their menstrual cycle? It stops, right? Or it gets dysregulated or it goes from 28 days to 32, then it's like 25 days and it's all up and down and erratic. And one of the, not the only reason, but one of the reasons is that they're trying to go on the extremely low fat diet and that can wreak havoc on the hormonal system. Blood sugar control. We need fat to control our blood sugar. I talked yesterday about it. We always talk about our BFF, our best friend forever. Well, for blood sugar control, your best friend forever is your PFF, which is your protein, fats, and your fiber. So fats is an integral part of controlling your blood sugar. The reason being is that with fat consumption, they've shown with a glucose tolerance test that it stabilizes your insulin level. We know insulin is very, very important for diabetes and all sorts of other uh, chronic issues that we have these days. And if you look at the chart here, when you, have you guys ever done a glucose tolerance test, anybody? So what do you have to do? What do you have to drink? That sweet drink, right? I mean, some people like it, some people think it's disgusting. You drink it, 50 grams of it, and then they test your blood at 60 minutes, and then maybe 90 minutes, and then 120 minutes to see what it does. And this is typically what it does, because it's just straight glucose. Now, when you eat fat, this is what it does to your insulin level. So in regards to, if you think about the big picture, uh, it's really important for stabilizing your blood sugar and keeping the insulin level nice and flatlined. We think of flatlining as a bad thing because for the heart, we want it to be jumping up and down for heartbeat. But in regards to blood sugar, we don't want it to flatline because that helps control blood sugar. And that is one way that you can de-stress the body in the long run, long term. Inflammation, so any sort of condition that you have or your client has been diagnosed with, with ITIS, plantar fasciitis, uh, colitis, bursitis, it's an inflammatory condition. Uh, we know one fat in particular, I'm sure all of you know, with omega-3s, the fish oils, uh, they're a potent anti-inflammatory fat. So it has a very good physiological effect on the body. You'll see that there's some other fats that I'll recommend that also have an anti-inflammatory effect on the body. So anytime you see ITIS, you got to start thinking, mm, do they need more fat? And that's where you got to start looking and doing some research on what they're eating on a daily basis. Losing weight. We're all in the business of helping our clients to lose fat, lose weight. And what we find over a period of time is that if someone is on a quote-unquote diet, and you think about the word diet, it's die with a T. <laughs> um, not very a, a good word. And so, and it's typically, you think of as a diet is only short term. It's only for eight weeks or six months or maybe it's a year. But ultimately what ends up happening is people that go on a low-fat diet, what do we know that they typically get when they're on it for maybe six to eight weeks? 
what do they start feeling? Fatigue, but then they have cravings. So usually what happens is that they're not satisfied with their food. Uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just go on YouTube and I'll look at bodybuilding diets and, and, and all these different uh, bodybuilders that are out there. And it's funny, I looked at one and he says, oh, I just finished my meal and I'm just already hungry. And he just had oatmeal with egg whites. And you wonder why. I mean, I mean and that's what I used to do as, as a bodybuilder when I was younger, in my younger years, is that's what I would do is just low fat, low fat, low fat. Um, most of our clients aren't bodybuilders, but even then with some of the bodybuilders, they need more fat into their diet. That's why they have so much hormonal dysfunction and all these other things. But most of our clients, they get hungry all the time and then they start thinking about food all the time. And that's not good because then they have almost an obsession with food and they're thinking about it all the time. So it's very important for satiety. We want people to enjoy food. Food is not a bad thing. I want my clients, I want my athletes to enjoy their food, sit down and be satisfied after eating. I mean, just look at if you gave somebody, if I had all of you try a non-fat ice cream versus a Ben & Jerry's full-fat ice cream, what are you going to enjoy better? I mean... Hands down, no problem. It's going to be the full fat Hagen Dazs Ben and Jerry's ice cream because it has fat in it. So instead of eating the whole pint, they might have maybe a scoop of ice cream. And with those non fat products, usually there's a ton of what in it? Sugar. Sugar, right? For mouthfeel, texture, to replace the fat. This is the other thing is that when people aren't satisfied, they're constantly craving sugar. That's a big one. So whenever someone, this is a little tip, if you eat your lunch this afternoon and you finish it at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock rolls around 2.30 and you're like, hmm, I just need some chocolate or I need something sweet. Those are classic signs that they most likely didn't get enough fat in the previous meal. Because at that time, the, the food is somewhat digested. It's getting into the bloodstream. So the question is, is it stabilizing you? And when people have sugar cravings, then that's pr probably a sign that they didn't get enough fat. Possibly the protein as well. But fat can be a big one. Another one, as I just said earlier, is with the bodybuilders, they're e eating no fat, so they're just hungry constantly all the time. And then they're just kind of obsessed with eating all the time and food, and they're focused on their hunger. So it's very, very important uh, for, for that satiety feeling. And the other part of it is that it just doesn't allow them to make good choices. So they may have good vegetables and good whole foods, and then all they want to do is eat chocolate and processed foods and chips and crackers and all sorts of other things that we know have no nutritional value. And so that's why you can sit down and eat not just one chip, but you even sit down and eat the whole bag because there's no nutritional value to it. And your blood sugar goes up and down. Anybody have any questions so far? You good? Yep. Yeah. You have what? Poached eggs. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. And a lot of our, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a lot of our clients that we work with. I was saying this yesterday is that uh, during the fat loss uh, panel is that they're simply not aware in, in exercise and rehabilitation, we have what we call that term sensory motor amnesia. I'm sure some of you have heard of that. So let's say, for example, someone gets an ACL surgery, and so they get that big old scar, and it's replaced. Well, with it, any sort of scar that someone has, they're going to develop, through the healing process, they're going to develop scar tissue, and then they're going to develop trigger points within the scar tissue. Anytime someone develops scar tissue and trigger points, that will cause sensory motor amnesia in that whole area. So the potential is that you're going to get inhibition of all the key stabilizers of the knee. And we know one of the key stabilizers of the knee is the VMO, the vastus medialis oblique. In the same way, a lot of people just have this sensory amnesia of how food affects them. They don't correlate, well, that Danish and that donut and that frappuccino in the morning, doesn't, they don't correlate that with having low energy or sugar cravings in the afternoon. They just think, oh, well, I, it's normal for me to have uh, sugar cravings. Uh, and there's a big difference. I learned this a long time ago from a, um, a, a colleague of mine. A lot of people say that 
oh, it's normal for me to have it. It's not normal physiological function to have sugar cravings all the time. It's very common for all of us and our clients to have it, but it's not normal physiological function. That means that, again, you have to reassess and see what did they eat an hour or two beforehand. Right. No, it's not. No. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. Yeah, she, her question was, you know, I would have thought that uh, bodybuilders, they eat so much protein. I mean, literally, it's just horrendous. They eat like 500 grams of protein a day. I mean, uh, and, and you would think that they would not be hungry. But the problem is that, uh, I mean, one, they're, they're, they're so big, uh, depending on who you're, you're talking about. But fat has a powerful mechanism in regards to satiety. And it goes, that goes into hormonal fluctuations and changes. But they need to have more of a combination. Some of them are, are, are learning it because they're realizing, I can't do this for six months on end. Or they do it and they just go nuts. And what ends up happening? Within two days, they gain, what, 30 pounds? Because it's, just, it's, just, it's, a, it's a funky relationship with food. Uh, we hear about... Uh, an eating disorder, but it's disorderly eating that happens. I mean, I my from as an example, I finished my first dieting for my first show, and I sat there and I ate probably I don't know six to eight scoops of ice cream, and then my friends were like, "Come on, let's fucking go," and so I'm like, "Okay," so I grab three more things of ice cream and I'm eating it out of the university dormitory, and I remember that distinctly. I mean, that was you know a long time ago, but. Um, that's how depleted these people get. Um, and we'll go into what practical applications of when you start putting fat into the diet. Um, some of your clients may go bonkers, and we'll talk about that, uh, which is normal. Uh, all of you should get this book. It's called Know Your Fat for Mary Enig. She is who I call the fat lady. She's not fat. She's, <laughs> she's skinny as a rail. She's an older woman. She's probably in her six, 60s, maybe 70s now. But um, very, it's, a, it's probably the authority on fat. She was the woman who did a lot of the research on all the trans fatty acids out of the University of Maryland. She really uh, spearheaded a lot of the good scientific information about the detriments of trans fatty acids. But she gives you a lot of the, the hard data science. So she says, none of the naturally occurring fats and oils is made up of only all saturated or all unsaturated fatty acids. Rather, they are a mixture of different, they are mixtures of different amounts of various fatty acids. So when we say something is saturated fat or monosaturated fat, that's actually not true. It was just a kind of a simple way for us to try to get across that, oh, this had a lot of saturated fats or monosaturated fats or, or PUFAs. But you'll see that uh, it goes way beyond that, that it's actually incorrect the way we classify fats. And 54 54% of the fat in regular steak and beef fat is actually monounsaturated. It's unsaturated. About 40, 45% is saturated. So it does have saturated fat, but it does have the other mixtures of the other fats. Now, you look at lard. We all think lard is so bad, but I don't know if you remember if when you were younger, you, either your grandma or your grandfather would save the lard, the beef tallow, and then reuse it and cook it. Yeah, they still do, um, and they should, and we should do that, because in reality, and, and according to Inig, 60% of it is unsaturated in lard. So bacon is actually unsaturated, most of it. About 40 to 45% of it has saturated fats. So it's actually quite a healthy fat. Yeah, they put it on bread as well. Yeah. Bread and lard, yeah. Yeah, right. And then 70% of chicken fat is unsaturated as well. So that dispels a lot of our thoughts about how we classify fats and how we look at fats. And if you looked at an egg, I told you before, they said don't eat eggs, and they said now eat eggs, and then in fact they're going to make up their mind. But if you look at just the egg itself, and you look at the fats that are composed of it, it does have cholesterol, of course. It does have saturated fat. But it also has oleic acid, which is a monounsaturated fats that you find in almonds. So we always say, oh, eat your nuts and seeds. Well, you get the same fat in an egg as well. 
So is everything about an egg is heart healthy. You're getting all the other nutrients that are important for brain health. You're getting colon, inositol, all these other nutrients that are in eggs as well, depending on what they ate. So for example, with these eggs, if they were free range organic eggs, that means the chickens were out eating insects and bugs and lizards and all sorts of other things. And if you compare a organic egg versus a conventional raised egg, and you just look at the physical differences, you crack open a conventional egg, it's almost like a, a pale yellow soup coming out. There's no integrity. And you crack open a free range egg, and it almost looks as if it's reddish, orangish versus uh, a pale yellow. And it's, you're like <laughs> trying to crack the egg open because the shell is so hard. Uh, so that's just a physical difference. Um, but if you look at the research of um, Artemis Amopoulos, so this is another lady that you should look into. And she has a book. Uh, it's called the Omega Diet. Simopolis. I think that's how we spell her last name. But that's an OS at the end. But she has she talks a lot about the um, omega threes in the diet, and she did some research on the conventional raised egg versus the organic egg, and the organic or the conventional raised egg has about twenty to one omega six to three that ratio, and we know to be healthy you should be more of a two to one ratio omega six to to three, and with the organic egg it's a one to one ratio because of what the chicken ate. So it's very important to get high quality eggs. Yeah. If someone eats a free egg, what does it eat? Doesn't eat eggs or doesn't eat meats or anything? Oh, just eggs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, then you would just eat any other protein source. So you could eat ham, you can eat sausage, you can eat any of those th different things. Yeah, we'll get into that. Yeah. Yeah, the question was, you know, after a few months or so, uh, the person gets maybe nauseous about eating eggs and so forth. Uh, sometimes that could be a sign that they're having an intolerance to eggs. Yeah, so the thing is, you know, with the whole egg issue, people say, oh, I love eggs. Well, I said, well, I don't want you to have eggs every single day. And the reason why I say that is not because it's bad for your heart. Uh, I, I don't mind if they ate 12 eggs a day. Uh, that's not a problem. What I am concerned with is that uh, sometimes a lot of us, we tend to eat the same, I don't know, eight foods yeah. <laughs> and ten foods. That's about it in our food vocabulary. So the problem is that over a period of time, they may build up what we classify as a food intolerance. So it's not a food allergy if someone eats a peanut, they go to anaphylactic shock, and you've got to use a Pepi pen. We're talking more of a delayed reaction. So a perfect example is someone eats milk and they have lactose intolerance. What happens? Maybe a couple hours later, they start farting or they get bloating. Um, you know, or the next day, like for me, if I eat dairy, uh, then I'll have a runny nose next morning. So those are delayed reactions. So those are real reactions. It's just unfortunately the medical community doesn't really recognize the food intolerances. They only recognize the food allergies. Yeah, so that's something that you may have to look into. So one of the fats that we talked about earlier, the trans fats, and those you must avoid. And I'm probably speaking to the choir when I bring up some of these issues, but I still want to make sure that you're well aware of them. And with the margarines, that was when they converted the oils into this margarine. And what that did was it completely can't change the chemical structure of it. So you're changing a normal oil uh, into a, a hard fat oil at room temperature. That's basically what they did with the trans fat. And it has implications on... Uh, with you know, the way we cook it. So if you cook a vegetable oil, whether it's corn or cottonseed, um, all these oils are very sensitive to heat and light. So once you heat it at a high heat, it will turn into a trans fat with all those different chips and whatever fried foods that, that we're eating. Uh, and it's definitely, you de definitely have a risk of a heart attack, for sure, over a period of time, um, as they're consuming a lot of these trans fatty acids. 
uh, also with diabetes. Uh, the interesting thing about diabetes is that it's definitely multifactorial in the sense that uh, what happens with someone with type 2 diabetes is that their cells, over a period of time, uh, they get very resistant to insulin basically coming in. So whenever you eat something with uh, influence on glucose, your insulin level goes up to manage it. It's trying to manage it and put it in different places. And oftentimes when trans fats are consumed, it's been shown to prevent the cells from absorbing glucose the way it should uh, into muscle cells and liver cells. So guess where it goes into the third spot? It goes into a lot of fat cells. So that's why a lot of type 2 diabetes uh, we see them, the body type tends to be overweight. And there's a new term that they're using, they're calling it not uh, diabetes, but they're calling diabesity. So it's a combination of uh, obesity and diabetes at the same time. Ultimately, it comes down to lifestyle factors with a lot of the chronic diseases that we see these days. They're trying to come up with one miracle pill for this or this or that. There's no miracle pill, just like it is with fitness. There's no one miracle p pill for us to lose 10 kilos of body fat. There's, you know, there's just no sexy part of it, that one cool thing that's going to you know, do the job. It's, it's lifestyle. It's the, the hard work that we have to do or the client has to do and how we need to coach them. Uh, with our males, it will tend to definitely cause the testosterone drop and lead to things like erectile dysfunction and all sorts of hormonal disruptions in the body. Um, also with fat cells, so this is a really good explanation for a lot of your clients when they say, I'm addicted to fish and chips, I have to have it, or I have to have my french fries every day, and their goal is they want to lose fat. Well, if you look at some of the studies, what's interesting about trans fats is that when they feed f trans fats to rats, what ends up happening is their fat cell size, they increase in size, so we know that as hypertrophy of fat cells, and you guys have heard of hyperplasia which just means the increase in number of uh, cells. Well, it doesn't typically happen with muscle cells. But with fat cells, and especially with trans fats, it causes hyperplasia of the fat cells. So not only does it increase the size of the fat cell, it also increases the number of fat cells. And that's why you see people, they get um, lipo, get the fat, <laughs> which I don't know if you ever looked at it under... I mean, National Geographic or whatever. I mean, it's the most barbaric thing I've ever seen. I mean, I don't know if you can imagine that it's going to be nice and smooth and you're going to have smooth skin. But anyways, um, <laughs> people have that, and guess what? They get the fat back because they didn't change their lifestyle because fat can regenerate that way. And that's the interesting thing about trans fats. So that's one way you can explain to your clients, look, really limit your fried food. Um, there's other options and other ways you can fry your food without uh, causing the increase in trans fatty acids, yes? There must be a huge amount of uh, waste of energy going into producing and building more fat cells rather than doing other stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's a tremendous amount of energy that's wasted, yeah. and it puts an undue yeah. stress on the body. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you look at uh, a microscope, you put the trans fats underneath a the microscope, they almost look very similar to plastic. You just compare it, and they look like a plastic. Because it's man-made. It's nothing that the body's ever seen. So you definitely want to avoid the trans fats. There's no question. Also, be aware with labeling. Uh, I, was, I, I always like to go to other countries when I'm presenting and go to the, the food stores and look at the labels. And I don't ever look at the nutrition facts so much, but I look at the ingredients. So whenever you're looking at food bars or products and packaged food, always look at the, uh, nutrition, I mean, the ingredients versus just the nutrition facts. Because oftentimes it'll say zero grams of trans fat, but you'll see in the ingredients it says, well, it says hydrogenated vegetable oil. Well, how the hell does it have hydrogenated vegetable oil? Well, this is a little trick. So what they do is they say, oh, well, this bar has two servings in it, right? And then what they say is they can legally put zero grams of trans fat as long as it's under 0.5 grams of trans fat. So if it has half a gram of trans fat per serving, that person's eating that food bar and they're eating one gram of trans fat twice a day. So they're still getting trans fats in the system. So do you say anything oil? Hydrogenated. Whenever you see this, the, the word partially hydrogenated, that is that chemical transformation into a trans fatty acid. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, I mean, bars aren't perfect, but, you know, I have clients that, I, there's just no way I can keep my blood sugar stable or this and that. So I said, okay, that's fine, um, you know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you do have to be aware of the labeling because that's the way they get that loophole. I mean, it's, it's just very similar. You guys have ever uh, have the, the oil sprays? Well, they put oil spray and they say it's non-fat. But if you look at the serving size, it's one eighteenth of a second. That's like, tch. well, what do we know about when you use the spray? You go, pssst. oh, I missed the spots. I mean, but that's the way they get around that. That's the way they trick a lot of us and our clients in regards to the labeling. So be aware of that, because how can it be non-fat if it's all fat? So usually what's recommended, they say, well, you should eat only olive oil and nuts and seeds and monetize your fats. That's the only thing that you should eat. And they say, those are the healthy fats. Eat the healthy fats. That's what you should do. Just eat the monetize your fats, because those are what we consider to be the heart-healthy fats. So what if I told all of you in the room, I said, with all the other exercises out there, you can only do crunches for your core. That's the only thing you could do. You should only do that. I'm a presenter on core function, and you should only do crunches. How ridiculous does that sound? We know the body functions in three planes. Sagittal plane, transverse plane, frontal plane. So to do one plane, you're missing the other two planes, right? And we know through function, you have to move in all the other planes. Otherwise, you're going to cause dysfunction, especially with the abdominal wall. In the same way, in this industry with nutrition, we've told people, just eat one fat. And that's ridiculous. Your body needs all of the fats. Your body needs the saturated fats. It needs the cholesterol. It needs the monosaturated fats. It needs the omega-3s, the fish oils. You guys got that? Very, very important. So you need the blend of fats in order for your body to be healthy and to perform well, whether at work, school, sports, play, whatever it is. Unfortunately, especially with all the saturated fats, they told us, frown upon it, don't eat it, it's bad for you. It's going to cause you to have a heart attack if you have a piece of bacon. That's the mentality that we've had. Saturated fats in particular are very, very important for the liver, the function of the liver. So we know the liver is very important for detoxification. I talked about that yesterday in Practical Strategies for Detox but we fail to realize that saturated fat is important for detoxification of the liver. Also, uh, for the protection against microbes, bacteria, viruses, fats are very, very important for the immune system. So any of your clients that are immune challenged, they always call you, oh, you know, I got sick again, or Bobby and Tommy's all sick, and I'm sick, and Bob's throwing up. And if that's that sort of person then you probably need to assess what they're eating because they're probably not eating either enough fat or maybe the right types of fats within their diet or their nutrition plan. Uh, so fats, and I'll show you uh, in particular some fats that have that immune-boosting effect. You know, quite surprise you which ones I'm going to talk about. Uh, also with aches and pain. So we always work with clients with musculoskeletal pains. They have shoulder neck pain. They might have low back pain. Uh, and fats will help with that, especially the saturated fats in regards to some of the healing that needs to occur. Uh, also, uh, there's interesting research on the heart, that the heart uses saturated fats as an energy source, which is kind of cool to know. Uh, and so that's quite surprising when I found that. But it's, it's very important for heart health, uh, the saturated fats. And also, in regards to the... Uh, the assimilation of the essential fatty acids. So a lot of us take the fish oils and we take all these different fatty acids, but you need saturated fats because on the enzyme level, that's how your body assimilates uh, these essential fatty acids. You need what's what we call delta-60 saturase. And you need that enzyme in order to assimilate your fats into essential fatty acids. Uh, it's something that a lot of people don't realize. You'll see this chart if you get that book, Know Your Fats, by Mary Enig. Uh, she shows that uh, step by step in her book. 
And so a lot of us is, are tugged each way. Our clients are tugged this way, go this way and this way. You shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that. And that goes the same way with cholesterol. So cholesterol, we always think of it as kind of a murky, mm, it's, I don't know, it's bad for us. It's going to, again, that heart-clogging effect with cholesterol. But with cholesterol, it's very important. It's actually vital for many different functions in your body. And I showed you slides earlier, and I want to bring it up again because you look at the phospholipids in through here and look at what's in between here. Those yellow little balls here, those are bits of cholesterol that are within all your cells. So I talked about the communication of the cells, and cholesterol is very, very important for that communication of the cells. And within the cells, it's what we call uh, rigid rigidity of the cells. So if the body doesn't have enough cholesterol or saturated fat within the cells, then the cells kind of just slosh around. And so you need some of it in order to give the cells some integrity so that they don't just kind of flop around within the body. And that's where cholesterol is very important as well as the saturated fats. Yep. Oh, yeah, we're going to get into that later on. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're a bit ahead of me. Uh, this is a very important slide. If you get anything out of today, just remember this one slide. Remember I talked about hormones yesterday. Hormones are very, very important for our health. They can cause a lot of dysfunction if they're too low or too high or all over the place, depending on where they're at. But you can see here from this slide, I'm not making this stuff up. You just go into any sort of textbook on biochemistry on hormones, endocrinology, anything. And for some reason, endocrinologists forget this, but cholesterol is your raw ingredient to make your hormones. Aldosterone is a hormone that your body uses to stabilize your sodium potassium balance, water balance. So for those of our clients that are constantly bloated all the time, they feel like they're just not regulating their water intake, you gotta look at their cholesterol consumption. Are they having the raw ingredient to produce aldosterone? Progesterone is a big one. Um, most women, as they get older, they get an imbalance of estrogen and progesterone. They have too much estrogen and progesterone, typically. Not all the time, but it does happen. Um, and then we have testosterone for males. More than ever, males are having issues with lower testosterone. And it's not talking about the 45, 50 year old clients. We're even talking about the 35 year olds that are having no sex drive, having you to use Viagra. Um, and that should not be happening. Uh, and then we also have estradiol, the estrogen, and then cortisol. Cortisol is one of those hormones that your body uses for stress response. So anytime that we get stress, mentally, emotionally, physically, cortisol is produced by your adrenal glands. They sit right above your kidneys, about the size of a walnut, and they're very small, but they deal with a lot of different functions in the body and namely uh, allowing your body to tolerate stress. And so oftentimes when people are put on you know, low cholesterol diets or they lower their cholesterol artificially, then you do not have the ability to make all your hormones. Do you know about the cholesterol metrics? Yeah, we're going to get into that. Yeah, don't worry. I won't forget that one. Yeah. Uh, and then I talked about vitamin D. Uh, most, probably 80 to 90 percent of people are deficient in vitamin D. And one of the main reasons is that even if they go into sun, what are they wearing in the sun? Sunscreen. If you look at the research of Edward Gorham, he's a researcher out of UCSD about malignant melanoma, which is cancer of the skin. He says that people that should not be in the sun, so the fair skin people that burn really easily, should be in the sun. Now, what he's saying is you should be in the sun not to burn, but you should expose as much of your skin uh, to the sun between the worst times, which we say to stay out of the sun between 10 to 2, and noon is the best, but you don't go there to burn. But that's one of the ways that your body produces vitamin D. Uh, dogs sit out in the sun, and they lay in the sun because that's the way they produce vitamin D, and they lick their fur, and that's the way they produce and get vitamin D into their system. Uh, so we need to do that more in order to get vitamin D. But you see here from this slide, in order to get that production, what is that? 7-dehydrocholesterol. You need cholesterol to make your vitamin D. So that's one of my theories. 
I haven't found the research, I'm sure it's coming or it's maybe out there I haven't found, is that the lowering of the cholesterol is lowering the body's capacity to produce vitamin D, even if maybe if you're in the sun. Uh, so we'll see if that comes out. But you can see how important it is for your sex hormones, your stress hormones, but also for vitamin D, because vitamin D is really a hormone in the body. That's what it comes down to. We classify it as vitamin D, but it's, it's really a, a very powerful hormone. And it's, yes? Yeah, it, it, it varies. So if someone's very fair-skinned, I mean, within five minutes, if they start to touch pinky, they get out of the sun. See, the, the thing is with sunscreen, just, just think about this logically. When you get a sunscreen on your body, let's say it's 30 SPF, it's allowing you to stay in the sun, I don't know, 10, maybe 20 times longer than you should. So what ends up happening is it blocks out all the UVB rays. The UVB rays are the ones that help your body produce vitamin D. The UVA ones are the, the damaging ones uh, that create uh, malignant melanoma. But the problem is you stay on the sun 30 times longer than you should. So what happens is the UVAs get into the deeper layers of the dermis, which causes malignant melanoma. What blew me away is that this guy had a slide of when they, the, the uh, introduction of SPF uh, sunscreens, and he shows point for point as the SPFs went up from, I don't know, 5 or 8 to 20 to 25 to 30 to 35, a concomitant rise of melanoma. I mean, perfectly graphed. And that's a correlative study, which isn't oh, what we always think of as the gold standard for like a cause and effect or an intervention study, but I mean, that's pretty right on. So what I'm, I'm not saying to go on the sun and be a lobster and fry, but what I am saying is that, you know, it, just think about it. If you go out in the sun and you expose just your arms, over a period of time, even if you're fairly fair-skinned, you adapt, right? You don't burn after a while. So you have to definitely slowly build up your time in the sun, uh, but you don't, definitely do not want to burn. But if you have to use a sunscreen because you're going to be there out for hours or surfing or whatever, uh, then you should go to a website. It's called ewg.org. Um, and I know in Australia, you guys have, in New Zealand, you have very good sunscreens uh, just because of the way the sun is. Um, but they, they tell you a lot of the different sunscreens that are non-toxic. It's EWG. It stands for environmentalworkinggroup.org. So you can go to the website and look at all the different ones. They, they grade them in their scales and tell you which ones are really good, which ones are bad. Recovery. So a lot of us that are working with our clients, if they're getting sore and they're staying sore for two to three days at a time, yes, it could mean they're not eating enough protein. But remember, cholesterol is very important for tissue recovery, for the, the regeneration of the tissues. So they may not be eating enough cholesterol to allow the body to repair the tissues. And also, this is a picture of uh, a nerve. So at the top, this is a kind of a... Uh, shredded myelin sheath. This sheath, this is the nerve here, and what's surrounding it is called the myelin sheath. And that myelin sheath is very uh, nourishing to the nerve. It's protective. Your body needs cholesterol to produce the myelin sheath. So it's very, very important for anybody who has any sort of neurovascular disease. They have the shakes, uh, MS, Parkinson's, any of those things. Cholesterol is very, very important for that. This is showing a normal artery, and then this is showing a narrowed artery by plaque. And so typically they say that, okay, well, cholesterol causes this plaque buildup. Well, if you have a fire going on in your house, and the firemen come, and they put out that fire, are the firemen bad? No. Well, in the same way, when the artery gets inflamed... We know that inflammation is a major problem in the body for a lot of people, especially with heart disease. So when the arteries get inflamed here, the body is just being smart. It uses cholesterol and other fats to lay down and put the fire out, just like the firemen. So does that mean the cholesterol is bad? No, it's doing its job. It's what it's supposed to do. So that's why we have a misinterpretation of what cholesterol does and if it causes a heart attack or not. Uh, it does not. And what I want to make you aware of in regards to cardiovascular disease is that if this is a 100-piece puzzle or so, 
I would say cholesterol maybe in regards to its impact on cardiovascular disease or heart attack represents maybe five or ten pieces. We must look at the other factors. We're always just looking at one thing. And I told you already before, a lot of the different conditions that we see with chronic diseases are multifactorial, always, always multifactorial. We know through weight loss or body fat loss, it's not just simply dieting. It's a combination of, yes, nutrition, exercise, whole foods, maybe some supplementation, looking at their sleep patterns. Are they drinking enough water? It's not always one thing. Sometimes you do one thing and it, once in a while it does a trick and people, you know, they lose six kilos or whatever, but that's not always the case. So we have to look at other markers, HDL, LDL, but the big one is triglycerides. Uh, so if you look at a lot of research, if their triglycerides are really high, that usually means they have more of a proneness towards heart attack or heart disease. And you'll see triglycerides being high on their blood work. It's a standard blood work that most people get run on them when they see the doc. And if it's high, that means they're consuming too many sugars, too many carbohydrates, most likely. There's other markers we can look at, but usually that's an indication. Sometimes if people eat too much fruit, that can cause it to go up too high as well. Uh, lipoprotein little a is a kind of a family member of the LDLs, uh, but this is one of the markers that they use to test if someone has a proneness towards having a heart attack or heart disease. So you need to look at this as well, um, as well as CRP, uh, C-reactive protein. That looks at inflammation. It should be under one. Anytime it's up above that, then they're more in an inflammatory condition. So you can see that there's other things that we need to look at uh, just, you know, other than just their cholesterol and their fat intake or saturated fat. So typically they get blood work like this, and the doc says, well, you're over 200, you're 205 uh, with your cholesterol, so you've got to lower your cholesterol. And this is going to answer your question. So usually they're put on some kind of medication like this, which is a statin medication. Uh, Lipitor is the number one selling drug in the whole wide world. They've even suggested that we put it in the water supply so we can be prophylactic for our young ones, right? We're geniuses. We're smart. So that's what we do. But what you need, need to be aware of is that whenever you're taking any medication, there's always a side effect with medication, always, because it only works on one enzyme level. It just prevents an enzyme from working, and then boom, that lowers the cholesterol. The enzyme that I'm talking about is hmg coa reductase. And what it is, is it's an enzyme that helps your body produce cholesterol. So when you take the medication, it's a, a key, and it goes into lock, and then it locks that enzyme from working, the hmg coa reductase. The only problem is downstream, it also affects CoQ10 production. And we all know that coenzyme Q10 is very important for energy production. When we exercise, we lift weights, we run, we sprint, we jump, our body will manufacture more CoQ10. Well, when you're taking this, it doesn't happen. That's why they get a 30 to 40% reduction of cholesterol when they take these medications. But you're also just causing the body not to produce any CoQ10. Some of the side effects are myopathy, which is muscle pain. If it's really bad, it's called rhabdomyolysis, which is a severe breakdown of skeletal muscle mass. So you'll see maybe some of your older gentleman clients that are put on this prophylactically because they don't want to prevent a heart attack. They have all these muscle pains and aches. They can't put on muscle, which we know is an anti-aging effect. So for us to maintain muscle mass is very, very important uh, for bone health, uh, for protection of the hips, uh, for all sorts of other things. But it doesn't happen when people are taking this. Uh, that's the unfortunate thing. So that's why you're going to see maybe some people have issues with um, muscle pain, low back pain. Uh, who knows? It could happen within two weeks. It could happen within six months. Um, you just don't know. And what's scary is that they're constantly raising the dosages. So typically it's around 10 milligrams, but they're, they're using 20 milligrams, 30 milligrams if the cholesterol levels don't drop the, the way they think it should. Yes? I'm sorry? Yes. Yeah. So what really uh, sucks is that the pharmaceutical company that has uh, or one of them that makes uh, the statin drugs, they also have a patent form of a statin with CoQ10 added to it. 
because they know that it reduces CoQ10, but they won't release a product because no one's demanding it because the other one's selling so well, so why, why screw with it, right? So if any of your clients say, you know, and you should always ask, are you on this medication, then you should definitely recommend that they go on some kind of CoQ10 product because otherwise it's get, getting depleted every single day that they're using it. You can't ever tell them not, to, you know, say, don't take this medication, but you need to make them well aware of what nutrients are depleted because uh, you could literally save their life. Yes? If somebody's been given the statin purely prophylactic, mm -hmm. can, can you advise them to come off? You can if you want to. Mm -hmm. The medical community will probably go after you. No, I'm just joking. I mean, the, I, mean I, have, I have colleagues that they're, they're not doctors, they're not medical licensed professionals, and they say, yeah, you need to come off that medication. Um, I don't do that, and officially you cannot do that. Um, otherwise, you can get in real trouble. Um, what I do is I recommend that you always tell them what the side effects are and the adverse reactions. So all of you have smartphones. So what you should do is you should go and look at this uh, app. It's called Hippocrates. Because all of you will work with a client that has or will be taking some kind of prescription medication. And Hippocrates, what it does is it's an app that you can look up. And what it does is it gives you, you can type in any sort of medication. You can type in a statin. You can type in methotrexate. You can type in a calcium channel blocker for high blood pressure. And it'll tell you, boom, what are the adverse reactions? And you just take a snapshot, text it to your client. Look, this is what I'm concerned with. And when you do that, you're going well out of your way to look out for the well-being of your client. And your clients really appreciate that. Some may argue with you, which is fine. But at least you can sleep by night knowing that you gave them the proper information saying, look, be aware of this. I don't want you to haphazardly take a medication just because your doctor wants you to. Um, ultimately, the decision comes to the patient. But unfortunately, they're scared into taking it by the doc. Which also means they get rid of the medication. Right, that's what they say. I mean, I, I've, I've had a, one of my clients, she was uh, a referral from one of my other clients, and uh, she, she was seeing me for all these sorts of issues with digestion, and then she, you know, saw me the next time, and she said, "I'm so upset." And I said, "Well, what's wrong? You know, what, you know, how can I help?" And she said, "Well, I saw my doctor, and you know, I'm type one diabetic, as you know, and and he says I have to be on uh, this Lipitor medication because it's I could get a heart attack." And I said, "I don't want to do it." And he said, "No, you have to take it." And she said, "What do you think?" I said, "Well." Um, Politically, being PC, uh, it's ultimately up to you. And I gave her the data. I said, look, these are all those different things you're doing. You're not the typical person living your lifestyle this way. You are you saw me. You sorted out your digestive issues. You've done all these different things. In, in my opinion, you don't need to take it. But I can't officially tell you whether to take it or not. But you need to know that decision is up to you. It's not to your doctor. And that's the way I, I, I recommend how you approach it. And that's why that, this can be a very powerful tool. Because when they look at that, I mean, that's just what the drug companies put out. <laughs> if you look for the information, you can find it. Uh, yeah, uh, just one thing I want to go at is that uh, also with the statin medication, it does decrease protein synthesis of the brain. So then they start having short-term, long-term memory issues as well, especially with their older clients. So we have to be very... Uh, make them aware of that so they know. Um, so uh, the other thing is it, it does screw with the whole omega-6 to 3 ratio as well. So people that have the issues of inflammation, it only exacerbates it because it screws with that whole omega-6 to 3 ratio. Uh, and this is just CoQ10. So that was a great question that you had. Uh, you should always recommend that they take a high-quality CoQ10 product uh, at least twice a day and hopefully to just deter some of the side effects and the depletion that's occurring. Uh, this is the book. So I was just trying to get to this for you. No, that's okay. Um, so this book, all of you should get. It's the Drug-Induced Nutrition Depletion Handbook. Out of all the books I get, I probably have a book like this high of all these um, books about drugs and what they deplete, good pills, bad pills. But by far, this one seems to be the best on what nutrients get depleted. The only problem is that I've had students come to me, attendees, and they go, Rob, I looked it up, 
it's $280. And I mean, the book is maybe this small and about that thick. I don't know why it's that expensive. Um, I don't know if you can find it here, used or whatever, but even used, someone told me that it's quite expensive. You don't have to buy this book and, and read through it because you'll be bored out of your mind. You'll fall asleep in about two minutes. <laughs> but what it is, it, all it is is a reference. And then you can show a client, look, this is what's being depleted. When you take methotrexate, it's a cancer medication, and they use it for all sorts of autoimmune diseases. Uh, it depletes folic acid. We know folic acid is very, very important for our nerves and our neurological conditions that we have. So um, this is a book you should definitely get. Um, there's some other ones out there, uh, but this one I find is the best so far. Yeah, And that whole app is really cool because you can, you know, we all have smartphones, so we can use that. Uh, so with uh, MUFAs, that just stands for the mono and saturated fatty acids. So these are important, like I said before. We're not just telling people to just do crunches all the time and then to look like this and walking around like that. Um, we want them to have good alignment, good posture. Well, we want them to have good cellular health over a period of time. So that's why you can use, obviously, uh, things like olive oil. That's a good fat to use. Uh, there's potent anti-inflammatory effects because it has squalene in it, um, some other nutrients. And what's nice about it is that it keeps the blood sugar fairly stable. Uh, and most people won't be afraid to use olive oil, if you tell them. Uh, one oil I would advise not to use would be the canola oils. Is that, are, is that coming about more here? Yeah. So it's been a big push in the U.S. Uh, and uh, the, it's an interesting thing about canola oil because it's, it's an, actually it's called rapeseed. And what they do is it's called erucic acid. And they, it actually came from Canada. So that's why they got the name canola. Ola is oil in Canada. Um, but the problem is through the manufacturing process, sometimes you get a little bit, tiny bits of trans fatty acids in it. Um, so it's really not a good oil to be consuming a lot of uh, for long periods of time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, just be aware of that. Um, just have your clients try to use olive oil as much as possible as one of the, the main oils. Uh, also, the other thing with uh, olive oil, uh, you do have to be careful what we call the flash point. So when it starts to, if you turn the, um, the oven on the stovetop and it, the oil starts to burn, that means it's going rancid. So you can't just heat butter to, you know, to a high temperature forever. It's going to burn for sure. Anytime you heat something, it can cause something to go rancid. So just be aware with that, uh, with olive oil, with really high heat. Usually low to moderate heat and then use it a lot on your salads and your veggies and all sorts of other things. Uh, macadamia nuts are quite good. Uh, it also has uh, palmolytic acid, which has been shown to be antimicrobial. And that just simply means that it's anti-bug. So it helps... Uh, with bacteria overgrowth and all sorts of other things uh, that you see within the digestive system. And avocados are really, really good as well, especially for females. Uh, do you guys know how long it takes to grow an avocado? Nine months. So you get the correlation there? Yeah. And the seed right here, same thing. So there's interesting things about the historical facts about food. So females should definitely be eating their avocados. And avocados are a fruit. They're actually not a vegetable. We tend to think of it as a vegetable, but it's actually a fruit. And then we got the PUFAs. So these are the polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, that we're always educated about. And so with the PUFAs, namely we're thinking about omega-3. And uh, omega-3s, yes, it's something essential. So the polyunsaturated fatty acids or we also classify it as essential fatty acids. So there's fatty acids that we have to eat and consume. Uh, otherwise, our body cannot make them. And so that's why it's very important that we do get the omega-3s uh, within our diet. Unfortunately, if you look at the work of Artemis Amopoulos, the typical processed food diet with the pizzas and the you know, crackers and the donuts and the cakes and alcohol and everything else, the omega-6 to 3 ratio gets really screwed up. Uh, it's, generally, it's around 20 to 1, but if someone has a really, really poor uh, nutritional status, then what ends up happening is it becomes more like a 
30 to 1, 40 to 1 ratio. And that causes lots of inflammation and all sorts of disruptions uh, within the body. So uh, we have to be careful that and guide our clients eventually to the whole foods as much as possible. That's always a common theme. It's always going to be there. Uh, the more that you can go from um, you know, unprocessed foods to more whole foods, they're better in the long run, always. And in regards to chronic diseases, so we're seeing that that omega-6 to 3 ratio is a, has a big hand in it uh, in regards to the diabetes, uh, in regards to insulin resistance, and especially with inflammation because a lot of people are in a very pro-inflammatory state. They're just constantly putting their body in inflammation. So if you take that in the context of, let's say, you have a client who has low back pain or shoulder pain, and they're not getting better, they're seeing the physio, they're seeing the ART person, the acupuncturist, then usually that means that it's something that they're eating, uh, some kind of systemic inflammation that is not allowing the shoulder to heal. It's become more of a chronic issue than an acute issue. And usually uh, that inflammatory condition is, is a driving force of that. And so that's why the, the, the tissue doesn't heal over a period of time. So one of the ways to really reduce that is just to get the vegetable oils out. So just tell them what to shop for. Just say, look, I want you to just get organic olive oil, and I want you to start using that instead of using your corn oil, cottonseed oil, all those different oils. Because remember, once you heat them, they turn into a trans fatty acid. And there's a whole load of omega-6s that come with them as well. Yeah. So, if, for example, if you want to do fish and chips, for example, if at home, coconut oil is very, very stable at high heat. Yeah. So if you use that, it's very stable at high heat. You know, when they, when they first started at McDonald's years ago, they used beef tallow. That's what gave it its famous French fry taste or whatever you want to call it. Um, but then there was a big push, as I was telling you guys uh, earlier about the edible oil industry trying to uh, sell their oil but also making it, you know, that it was heart healthy. The problem is turning into trans fats. Uh, so, you know, it, you know, it, it's the coconut oil, beef tallow, uh, those are all stable at high heat. Yeah. And also high, high uh, grain consumption. Just hold on one second. With high grain consumption, uh, there's a research study uh, or article uh, that showed that the high grain consumption does cause an imbalance in the omega-6 to 3 ratio. So that whole issue of you got to eat 6 to 11 servings of grain a day, your bread, your pasta, your all those processed carbohydrates really throws that omega-6 to 3 ratio um, out the window and really causes an imbalance. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hold that question for later. So her question was about what do I recommend in regards to macronutrient ratios. Um, I typically don't recommend rac macronutrient ratios anymore. Uh, it's too hectic. Um, then the client goes, well, how am I going to figure out 30% versus 40%? Do I use a food scale? Do I have to travel to the restaurant with the food scale? So um, it tends to kind of paralyze them, paralysis by analysis. So um, I just try to make it real general, and you'll see it's really simple, uh, the recommendation I make. Uh, so with fish oils, um, that's another way to get that imbalance to, to normalize. I usually recommend two capsules per 20 kilos of body weight. Um, that's usually what I recommend. Uh, and make sure that you always get a good, high-quality uh, fish oil as much as possible. Uh, be aware with flax seeds. So real quickly, and you can look at the, this in Mary Inig's work, uh, with the flax seeds, it's a form of omega-6. You, you all heard that. So with flax, it's flax. It could be seeds. It could be chia. It could be walnuts. And these are classified as alpha lino lenic acid. 
Now, in order for it to eventually get down to what we call EPA and DHA, those are the two fatty acids that we want that potent anti-inflammatory effect on the body, helping with diabetes and inflammation and all sorts of good stuff. There's different steps here. I'm not smart enough to remember all the other ones, but you can look at Mary Enoch's book. She goes over it. The most important step for you to know is that right here, there's what we call, excuse me, delta-6 desaturase. That's the enzyme I talked about, and you see how it says saturase? That's dependent on saturated fatty acids. But what's also this is dependent upon is, or what it gets decreased by, is by things like stress, which I know none of you have, <laughs> and sugar, which I know you never consume, and coffee, I know definitely you guys do like a band of Starbucks here, and alcohol, which we never consume either, right? But all of our clients, they have all this stuff. So basically, they don't have that enzyme. And as we get older, they don't have the enzyme. So are they going to convert flaxseed oil and all these other nuts and seeds oils to this, what we do need in their body? No. So that's why you typically recommend if you need to have a more therapeutic effect of omega-3s and you know that person has had a really bad nutrition plan, you need to put the fish oils in there. Because when you start shifting a person's nutrition around, and it's just simply just having them eat less of the French fries and the you know, processed foods, it's an oil change. So just as you take your car to get the oil changed after 3,000 miles, 5,000 miles or kilometers, in the same way, if you just start shifting your, your client's fats to healthier fats, the fish oils, it's an oil change. It just happens over 12 to 16 weeks. Does that make sense? So you can always do the oil change. You just have to slowly educate your clients on what fats to eat. So I always recommend eat the fats. Always eat the fats versus just supplemental fats. Because you'll see there's other supplemental fats you can get. So as much as I recommend some fish oil supplements, you can get them through the foods that, we, that are you know, whole foods, the meats and fishes and so forth. So there's always a question, Rob, should I eat red meat or not? And it's absolutely yes. Eat red meat. It's very, very healthy for you. And the reason being is this. You see all the fat in there? The cleaner source of the red meat, the better it is for you. And the reason being is that, yes, you get cholesterol, you get saturated fat, but depending on what the animal ate, it's going to dictate what's in that fat. And so if you get grain-fed in a feedlot system, well, they're eating corn, which they should not be eating, and what it causes is it causes lots of acidity in the blood, and they get sick, and they have to pump them full of antibiotics. And guess where all the drugs and all those things go? It gets stored into fat. And then we eat the fat. So we get all the residues. So it's very important that if you're going to eat it, you try to get a very good source of it. Because cows should be eating this, grass, what they're designed to eat. They have five stomachs. It goes through every single stomach. And it gets fermented and broken down. And that's what forms omega-3s within the actual red meat. So believe it or not, Steak has red meat. I mean, steak, beef, bison, buffalo. If they're eating grass, it has omega-3s in it. But if you get just grain-fed, it has a whopping load of omega-6s in it. And that's what could cause a lot of the imbalances. So just simply looking at this graph, you can see the imbalance of omega-6s to omega-3s. Um, grain-fed versus grass-fed. Uh, it's a massive difference. It's a completely different product. Okay, and, you're, and you're also not getting the toxins from all the medications and the drugs that the animals have been on. Because they don't do body fat testing on cattle like we do on ourselves. They want to just get them as heavy and as fat as possible, and that's the way they do it. It used to take maybe four to five years to get a calf to steer. Now they got it down to maybe 18, 19 months, 20 months. They fat them really fast. So... Yeah, it's a lot better here. I noticed that. Um, but in other countries, not so good. Yeah. So it's a good thing that you guys do that here. Very good. 
And then also, there's a product called CLA. You guys heard of that? Conjugate allylic acid? Well, CLA is produced only in grass-fed meat. And we know CLA is anti-tumor, anti-cancer, and also helps you lose fat, and also helps you maintain lean body mass, muscle mass. And that's all found in red meat. That's how bad red meat is for you. Yeah. And what do we know? If someone has a nice steak, do they feel good after they're eating it? They feel satiated, satisfied? Yeah. Versus eating this dry chicken breast with salad and broccoli? No. They're, they're not going to be satiated. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes that can happen. It's a great question. Is, is the introduction of all these different fats going to cause maybe some sort of digestive issue? For some people that have a already compromised digestive system, possibly yes, um, especially with someone with a gallbladder removed because the gallbladder is very imperative for fat uh, assimilation and digestion. So in that sense, yes, um, that could be it. So what I'm not, I'm not saying to have them eat you know, three pounds of steak a day, but just have them introduce it. So you may have them introduce it maybe once or twice a week where they have it once every couple months, you know, and then they just start introducing it that way. And, and you want to try to rotate the food as much as you can. So you introduce different types of proteins so that they don't get bored of one or just eating eggs all the time. Uh, and that brings me to this. People mostly eat just egg whites. Remember, where does the chicken come from? Does it come from the yolk or the white? It comes from the yolk. So when people throw away the yolk, they're throwing away the most valuable part of the egg. And I've already showed you that, yeah, you're getting some cholesterol, you're getting some saturated fat. If you get a good high-quality egg, you're going to get the omega-3s and you're getting the heart-healthy monosaturated oleic acid. So really make sure to eat the whole egg. Uh, you'll feel more satiated. As you were saying, if you eat a couple poached eggs and an avocado, you're nice and stable. Your blood sugar is stable. Yep. Right. Great question. So what is causing the high cholesterol? Well, one thing is this. Uh, before I get into that, if you look at any of the package inserts for Lipitor statin medications, this, they said this product does not prevent heart attack or heart disease, but it does lower cholesterol. You see a difference? So my opinion is that if someone's cholesterol is at 240, there's a reason why it's at 240. And I don't tell clients, well, if you follow my nutrition plan, your cholesterol level is going to drop. Because what did I tell you that cholesterol is needed for? And for the production of what hormones? Your sex hormones and your stress hormones. How many people are stressed out to the max? They're highly stressed. So the body's just trying to produce more cholesterol to handle and produce more cortisol to handle the stress. So in my opinion, that's one of the reasons why we're having the elevation of cholesterol. Sometimes it's due to the other things. I don't try to lower cholesterol. That's never my goal. My goal is to always induce more energy, get, create better function in the body, and then the cholesterol is going to go where it needs to go. So I'm not really focused on cholesterol. I'm focused on the other markers of inflammation. If those markers are going down and cholesterol stays the same, I don't even worry about it. It's just that we've been led to believe that it has to be under 200. It must. Remember, the, 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 uh, the level of cholesterol was a concern if it was over 240. Now it's, it was 220. Now it's un, you know, under 200 they want it. When they moved it from, two, uh, I think, 220 to 200, it bumped up their customer base by about 10 million people. Kind of a bit of a money. That's what they always tell you. Yeah, that's their education process. Um, we can talk about this more, but I want to finish the slides. So if we can hold our questions to the end, I'm more than happy to stay after and ask, answer questions. Butter, it's heart healthy completely. Um, it's a four-carbon chain fatty acid, and it breaks down easily for energy, 
And as I said before, it's very important for the immune system. It's what we call antimicrobial, anti-bug. So to add butter to your food, it tastes good, it's good for your stomach, and it'll keep you satiated. So in the long run, for someone on, let's say, a fat loss plan, it keeps them on the plan because they don't ever feel deprived. It's butter from cows. No, that's 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 a similar to a margarine. That's right. So yeah. Too. Yeah, yeah, no, no. You just want to get straight butter. Like cream that's just made into butter. Organic yeah, organic as much as you can. That way you're not getting the toxins. Yeah. Um, coconut oil. You just hold your question to the end. I'll be happy to answer it. So coconut oil is a big favorite of mine, and it's really good for many reasons, uh, especially for inflammation. With IL-10, uh, that is one of the interleukins that's produced that has an anti-inflammatory effect on the body. So we're always talking about interleukins and how they can be pro-inflammatory. Well, IL-10 has been shown to increase and have an anti-inflammatory effect when you consume coconut oil. So coconut oil is very good for that. And again, coconut oil is very stable at high heat. So that's what's nice about it. Uh, also, with coconut oil, it's antimicrobial. So when you consume coconut oil, there's an acid called lauric acid. And lauric acid, when you consume it, it converts to monolaurin, which has an antimicrobial effect. It's antifungal, anti-candida, uh, especially with viruses. Viruses reproduce by injecting their DNA into a cell and then try to, to take over and it, it replicates and, and becomes the virus and it repeats over and over. When you eat coconut oil, the monolaurin doesn't allow the virus to replicate. It kills the virus. So that's what's powerful about coconut oil. Uh, and it's, it's good that there's a big push for it. It's also good for really good energy, uh, immediate source of energy. It digests differently than any other fat. It's classified as a saturated fat, but it's specifically classified as a medium chain triglyceride. So MCT, what that means is that it digests, it bypasses the stomach, it goes through the portal vein, goes straight into the liver, and you get, boom, immediate source of energy. But because it's a fat, there's no up or down of glucose. So your blood sugar stays nice and stable. So a lot of your clients that, oh, I just feel tired all the time. Have them fry their eggs in some coconut oil in the morning. It makes a tremendous difference. It gives them that immediate source of energy. Or if they, they need a bar, then get them to get a coconut-based bar. Um, they'll get better energy from that. It's also potently thermogenic. So a lot of different studies show that it does increase what we call dietary-induced thermogenesis. DIT, uh, that just means that it just helps you burn more calories. That's what that means. So that's an, another nice thing about coconut oil. It almost sounds unbelievable, but it, it's quite, you know, you hear about the miracle of coconut oil and all these different books. They're quite good. Um, this is a special uh, oil. Uh, it's borage oil, but you also have equivalents called uh, evening privilege oil, as well as black currant oil. And what they have is they have a fat called GLA. It's an omega-6 fatty acid. And what that has been shown to do is have a potent anti-inflammatory effect on the body, especially for your clients with arthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis. There's some good research on that. And also with uh, some of our female clients that are having a lot of menstrual cramping, pain, PMS symptoms, it works quite well for that. And usually the dosage is about 250 milligrams twice a day. Just take it with breakfast and dinner. Make it real simple. Uh, 250 milligrams. They usually come in 240, 250 milligram capsules. Yeah. And you can use e one of three, borage oil, evening primrose oil, or black currant oil. They have uh, roughly the same amounts of GLA in it. So that's one of the one exceptions in the omega-6 families that typically has a you know, pro-inflammatory effect if you have too much. This guy helps have a more an anti-inflammatory effect. So this is in regards to recommendations. I usually start people, if someone's on a really low-fat plan, I just say, I want you to add a tablespoon every time you eat. So whether it's cooking with a tablespoon of coconut oil or olive oil or, um, you know, like half an avocado, then they would use that as their starting point and go from there. And once you start with that, inherently what's going to happen is they're going to probably eat less food throughout the day and they're going to start to drop body fat or drop weight or whatever their goal is. So start with that, that tablespoon measure first 
And if it's too much, sometimes you can say, well, then what I want you to do is, since you have sugar cravings always after dinner, I want you to add a tablespoon after or with dinner. That way you can start to stabilize your blood sugar. Um, real quick, when if it's not enough too much with fat, the one of the main reasons why people have too much fat is if they get nauseated. So if they get nauseated and they have this heavy feeling, that means they had too much fat. When I started playing around with this years ago, I started eating bacon and eggs. And I would eat four pieces of bacon and fry two eggs in it, and then I'd have some vegetables. One time I did a whole pat of bacon, took the bacon out, fried five whole eggs in the lard, took it out, sauteed cabbage in the lard, took it out, and ate the whole thing. It tasted really good. I typically eat every two and a half, three hours at that time. I did not want to eat for about five hours. And that's, I was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. I mean, I took it to extreme. And we all need to do that. We need to explain, play with and experiment with ourselves, as just as we do with exercise. So I felt nauseated to the max. And I just felt like this heavy feeling in my stomach. Not bloated, but just super heavy, and I just didn't want to eat. That means they overate. And many of your clients may do that initially, especially when they're deprived of fat. That's okay. Then you just need to kind of reel them back in and say, okay, let's start to back off, and they'll find that natural set point. And that's something you play around with yourself first, so you can figure it out yourself first, and then you can start guiding some of your, your clients. That's very important for you guys to experience so you can explain it. Uh, so with the fat calories, very, very important. And I do love fat. Um, I think it's very important. I think you've all seen that it's very important. It's vital for function in your body. No longer should it, it be looked as your enemy. Fat is your friend. <laughs> so... I would love to hear from you guys. Uh, this is my contact with Facebook and Twitter. If you want to email me, robert at robertyang.net. Um, if you need consultations, I do work on Skype uh, internationally with clients or if you need help. And if you do need help with someone, what I require you to do is you can contact me or have the client contact me, and you must sit on the phone like a three-way call because that way you can learn. Does that make sense? And then that way you can apply it to other clients. Because ultimately that's what we're after. We want to educate you guys so you can start helping other people. Thank you very much. Oh, I charge two twenty an hour. Yeah. And if you go to the website, all the information is on there in regards to paperwork and uh, what I need from the person. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe with someone like that, if you're going to be doing all the other, the, the supplemental fish oils and supplements, then maybe don't do all, maybe do just whole eggs. Yeah, so maybe just don't do bacon, just do maybe some whole eggs and, you know, in an omelet. Yeah, yeah, but some people, they, they handle that and they feel awesome. So it's just a matter of maybe just.